this is the CXC, CSEC chemistry paper two from May, June, 2023, right? So we're just going to get right into it. Um, proceed with caution. Um, I should give the disclaimer that these are not the answers from CXC. I'm giving you a breakdown of what, your answer, what the answer should be. What CXC accepts, you know, it, it might vary. But we, um, as best as possible, will aim to give the correct answers, right? So, so number one is your good old data analysis um, question. We can always depend on that. Um, number one here, we're um, being asked not to spend more than 30 minutes on question one. No, number one, hydrogen peroxide H2O2 decomposes to produce oxygen and water in the presence of potassium iodide as a catalyst. The effect of the concentration of the hydrogen peroxide on the rate of reaction was investigated. For each experiment, the concentration of the hydrogen peroxide was changed and the time taken for the hydrogen peroxide to decompose was measured using a stop clock as shown in figure one. So part one of A, define the term rate of reaction. Change in concentration of reactant or product per unit time. Anything having to do with rate, there has to be, um, time has to be measured. Define the term catalyst. So it's a substance that is used to speed up the rate of a reaction, but remains chemically unchanged in the process. So the catalyst does not take part in the reaction. We could put that, we could state that as well. A substance used to speed up the rate of a reaction, but does not take part in the reaction. All right, so that will give us three marks. All right, so part B, for each experiment shown on the stop clocks in figure one on page four, record in table one, the time taken for the hydrogen peroxide to decompose. Write down these values to be used in our table a little later on before we get into anything um, big. So at first, we always look to see what the scale is on whatever the instrument is. Each of those stroke there is representing one second. So um, for the first one, in experiment one, um, this is 59. In experiment two, we have this at 42. In experiment three, this is at 31. In experiment four, this is at 25. In experiment five, this is at 21. So we're going to record those. We're going to keep those close by for a little later on. So we're going to do that. We made a note of those um, times. So we just need to fill in that in the time column. And then after that, in part C, we're just going to do everything in one. In part C, we're to complete table one by calculating the rate of reaction. This time the rate of reaction is one over time and they want it calculated to three decimal places for each of the experiments. So, the first one, we had mentioned that the first one, for the first one, the time is 59 seconds. Second one is 42 seconds. The third one, 31 seconds. The fourth one, 25 seconds. The fifth one, 21 seconds. And we're just going to take the inverse of those to say one divided by 59, and that will give us 0 0.017. That's three decimal places. Then one divided by 42, 0.024. One divided by 31, 0.032. One divided by 25, 0 0.040. Three decimal places. And then one divided by 21, which would be 0 0.048. So we're going to keep these in mind, we have to bear these in mind because we're going to um, now use these to actually plot our graph. 
Using the axis provided in figure 2 on page 7, plot a graph of rate of reaction versus concentration of hydrogen peroxide from the information in table 1. Draw the line of best fit through the points. And this is for 5 marks. So we're going to head on over to our graph sheet and we're going to plot a graph of rate of reaction versus concentration. So rate of reaction here is our dependent variable. The rate of reaction will get its value from the concentration of the hydrogen peroxide. So the hydrogen peroxide then is the independent, the concentration of the hydrogen peroxide is the independent variable that goes on the x-axis. And then our responding, then our responding variable or our dependent variable is our rate of reaction that goes on the y-axis. So let's go, let's figure out, the, let's go, let's figure out the scales on each axis and then let's plot and then let's draw our line of base fit and get five marks. All right, so we have our values that we're going to plot. We wrote them down a little while ago. So we just go right into plotting. But before we plot, we have to establish, we have to figure out the scale in each case. All right, so on the, let's look, on the x-axis, we find that um, 2cm, they use 2cm, 2cm to represent 0 0.05 units, right? So that means that each of those little milli, what's that? Each of those millimeter is going up by 0 0.005. Each of those little millimeters is going up by 0 0.005. And on the y-axis, we're seeing where 2 cm, 2 centimeters, um, they're, they're being used here to represent 0 0.005. So it means that each of those, each of those millimeter. That's the tiny box, each of those right here. That's the one I can actually touch. Each of those would be representing zero point. Each of those would be representing zero point zero 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 five. So at zero point one mole per dm cube. The rate there is 0 0.017. So we need to find 0 0.017. So this is 0 0.015. So this would be 0. Okay. Don't need to mark that. So we have 0 0.015 there. So 0 0.016, 0 0.017. And we would circle this. And then the next one. 0.15 is 0 0.024, so we find 0.15, then we go up to 0.024, that's 0 0.025 here, so 2, 2 behind, let's see, 0 0.02, 0 0.021, 0 0.022, 0 0.023, and 0 0.024. All right, and then... Following that, we have 0 0.2, 0 0.2, and that would be um, 0 0.032, 0 0.032, 0 0.032 would be here. We're circling, we can use encircle dots, or we can use X's. All right, and then the next one, 0 0.0, 0 sorry, 0 0.25. 0 0.25 on the x, and for that one, we have 0 0.04, 0 0.25 and 0 0.04. So that would be here. And then after that, we now have 0 0.30 and 0. Point, corresponding with that, 0 0.30, we have 0 0.048. 0 0.048 would be, it would be here. All right. So the next thing that we would need to do 
is to know, so we've plotted all our points, all five points correctly. The next thing would be to know, draw our line of best fit. Now our line of best fit does not always have to go through the origin, but it appears that this one would actually go through the origin. So let's do that. We we'll need a ruler to do it. I'm exempted based on what I'm using, but you would use your ruler. You try to get all the points to fall on this on this on a straight line. If it doesn't, if it doesn't, you try if they don't, then you try to get as many of them falling on the line as possible with an equal number falling off. But this this seems like a good trend line. Or that will get um them falling falling on a straight line here. Even if it did not go to the origin, that would have been fine. So we're now going to move on to the questions um, using this very, this very graph that we have plotted. All right, so we're at part E. Using your graph, well, part one of E, describe the relationship between the rate of reaction and the concentration of the hydrogen peroxide for two marks. So we'd need to go back to our graph and look to see what what the relationship is. We look to see how the rate is being affected by changing the concentration. So let us see what's happening here. So from this, we're seeing that, what are we seeing? We're seeing that as, as the, so follow on the x-axis, as the concentration increases, so increases taking place here, let's use green, so as the concentration is increasing, as we're going over here, we're seeing that, hey, the rate is also increasing. So we're seeing that as the concentration of the peroxide increases, the rate of the reaction increases as well. So we would need to, we would need to state that. So we just need to toggle between. So we're flipping pages now. So we're going, we're going, we're going between pages. So we need to write that down as the concentration of peroxide increases, the rate of the reaction increases. Right, and then the next question, they want us to determine the concentration of the hydrogen peroxide given that the rate of reaction is 0 0.045 per second, all right? So we would need to go back and we'd find 0 0.045 per second on the y-axis. So we need to find 0 0.045 seconds per second rather on the y-axis. So let's use a different color to represent this. And once we find it on the y-axis, we're going to draw a line from it going across. And wherever that line cuts our base fit line, our curve, we're going to draw a line or a straight line from that coming down to cut the x-axis. Wherever it cuts, wherever it cuts the x-axis, Right, did we come all the way or we need to come all the way? All right, and from what we see here, this looks like it is zero point zero point two, sorry, zero point two five six. So that we'll write it boldly. So that is zero point two five six mole per dm cube that would be the concentration okay so we make a note of that and then so in part f we are to calculate the mass of the hydrogen peroxide present in the concentration identified in E2 
which um, is 0 0.25 moles per dm cube. So we're pretty much converting here from moles to from moles to mass. Molar concentration, it's it's the same as saying. So mass concentration here is the same as saying moles being converted to grams but the number of moles is in a set volume so we say moles over dm cube or, or moles per dm cube now in order for us to move from moles to to mass we'd have to multiply by the molar mass which is in grams per mole and if we look at this we see that mole will cancel out mole and will be left with grams per dm cube so this will give us this will be 0 0.256 moles per dm cube times 34.01 grams per mole and this looks like a lot of working out for one we're not just working, we're not just looking for the answer, we're looking at how we arrive at the answer. So we're teaching within everything all in one. So that's 0 0.256 times 34.01. And that will give us, well, everything so far has been to three decimal places. So this is, and then we have three decimal places here. So we'll just be consistent. So this is 8. Point seven zero seven grams per dm cube, and they want us to know write a balanced chemical equation including state symbols to so show the decomposition of hydrogen peroxide. All right, so hydrogen peroxide, you know, pure hydrogen peroxide is a liquid, but they were varying the concentration here, so it means that it would be a uh, a solution of a liquid in a liquid. Peroxide is the solute and the water is the solvent. So we would write H2O2, very important. It's not the same as water. That second two makes a big difference. Don't take my word for it. Or you should take my word for it. Don't want you to try drinking this now. All right, so this will give us H2O, which is a liquid plus we'll get O2 gas. So to balance this, we would need to put a two. The oxygens are off. We have three on the um, right side, two on the, on the left side. Now if we put a two here and a two here, that would fix pretty much everything for everyone. So that's the balanced equation for three more marks and 25 marks, full marks. Let's check our time. Did we spend more than 30 minutes on this question? All right. Let's move on to the second question. Okay, number two, part one of A. Or A, at atmospheric pressure, water exists in three states of matter, while carbon dioxide exists in only two states. One, list the three states of matter in which water can exist. And this is for, for one mark. And as usual, we're thankful for small mercies. So those three states that water can exist in at atmospheric pressure would be Solid, liquid, and gas. Then they want us to describe the energy of the particles in each of the three states listed in part one of A above. So let's go with in the solid state. So in the solid state, the energy that we're describing here is the kinetic energy that the particles would have as a result of their motion. So in a solid, the particles are arranged in a fixed way, held by very strong forces of attraction. So they have nowhere um, to move to, they can only vibrate. So in a solid, um, there is very little, there is little 
very little to no kinetic energy. All right. In a liquid, we could say there is a moderate amount. And then in a gas, the forces of attraction are very, it's almost non-existent. So these particles can move in any direction all about the place with a large amount of space between them. So we say that there's large or enormous amount of kinetic energy present. Part three, name the process which occurs when carbon dioxide changes from one state to another. We have to appreciate the two states that it's in first. It can be in the solid state. It can be in the gaseous state. So that would be sublimation. Part four, describe how the arrangement of the carbon dioxide particles chain changes, yes, as carbon dioxide undergoes the process named in the A3 above. So it's sublimation. We'd have to decide which state we're moving from, whether we're going from the gas to the solid or the solid to the gas. All right. So we're going to start with the gas here. So let's just describe what happens first when we're in the gaseous state. Well, let's describe what happens first when we're in the, in the solid state and then as we move from the solid to the gaseous state. Heat would have to be applied. So let's go. All right, so we could mention here that it actually skips or they skip the liquid phase. So in the solid state, the particles in dry ice are very close to each other in a regular, in a regular way. As heat is added or as heat is applied, the particles begin to vibrate and quickly move into the state where they have large amounts of space between them. That's into the, into the gaseous state. So that is the gaseous state. And here, they want us to use appropriate diagrams to illustrate the lattice structure of sodium chloride crystals and the giant molecular structure of diamond. I I believe there's a there's a neater way to do it than I'm doing it right now. But as always, this is not technical drawing. We just want to show. We just want to be able to draw something that looks like a square. Then we get to our parallel lines so we can get it to look like a cube. Then we can take it from there. All right, so we're going to look at the lines at the back, which are going down. Well, that one that will join that. It's not a perfect cube, but we can actually work with this. So, all right, so in this one, I'm going to put chloride at each vertex, or what we call a corner. So, chlorides at the vertex. So I'm using the big one to represent chloride. So we have alternating chloride and sodium. So this would be, let's do the key. So this is chloride ion. And then this little one will be the sodium ion, Na plus ion. So sodium would be here. Sodium would be here as well. Sodium here, sodium here. And in the middle, there would be a chloride and would draw a line to show that there, there's, you know, electrostatic attraction between them. There's the bond right there, the ionic bond. All right, so sodium would be here, here as well, here. Chloride would be here. And we could have put sodium at each vertex. What's important to note is that each chloride ion is surrounded by six 
sodium ion and each sodium ion is surrounded by six chloride ion, which, whichever way we sample. All right, so let's um continue. So here we have a sodium, 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 chloride. Sodium would be here, sodium would be here. Uh, chloride would be there at the back. We can line that up much better. All right, so line would be coming down through there. One would be going across there. There's a chloride at the, that one at the back, line coming down, line going across. It probably should be blowing your mind now. There is a chloride at the front. I didn't focus on the front one. Sodium right there. And then there's one more. Sodium would be in the middle, a small one. And then from the top going through at the bottom. So that should give us our full mark. Then it, a much simpler one for diamond, we're gonna use carbon and we're going to show that one carbon is bonded to four more so this is our carbon in the center so each c represents a carbon atom and the line here represents a strong or we don't have to say strong we could say a covalent bond so that would give us three marks each and that would make it six so we're down to the last two in number two to make it up to 15 we have 13 so far Part C, in solution, two metals A and B form A plus and B two plus ions respectively. So it means the A forms A plus and B forms B two plus. Metal A displaces Fe from a solution containing Fe two plus ions, but metal B does not. Write a balance ionic equation to show the reaction between metal A and Fe2+. All right, kind of expecting something more like a reactivity series based on this, but this is where they stop it. So we'll just take it and be thankful for small mercies again. So, all right, so A is going to displace Fe2+. Plus. A is, in, is being treated as something in group one. It has a valency of one, so it will be, it will be a and A here would be a solid. If E two plus would be an aqueous medium, and from this we would end up with. A plus plus Fe solid. But each time for every atom or every mole of A that reacts, we get one mole of A plus or we get one mole of electrons actually being liberated. For each mole of the Fe2 plus, we need two moles of electrons. So it means then, even though we're not seeing the electrons, we'd actually we'd actually have. This is what we have happening. A is actually reacting to give A plus plus an electron. All right. And then on, so that is um, oxidation. Right. And then on the other side, now we have Fe2 plus actually gaining two electrons to be liberated as Fe, the solid. So if we have two electrons on the left, hand side, we would need two electrons on the right hand side. So to get that, we would need Two electrons, but we can't go in and multiply the electrons by two without multiplying the A plus by two. And anything we do to one side, we have to do it to the other side. So we'll end up with that. Then we remove the electrons and then we write back what we have. So we would need 2A right here. And we would need 2A plus. And that would do it. And this would give us the additional two marks to make it up to 15. How many have you gotten so far? All right. Just like that, we've come to the end of this question.
continue with the others and see how many marks you've amassed so far. Couple later. Okay, so we're at number three, and this is an organic chemistry question. Figure three shows the fully displayed structures of three compounds, A, B, and C, which are from different homologous series. All right, so let's examine compound A. Um, this looks like a saturated hydrocarbon. All we have is a carbon-carbon single bond and carbon-hydrogen single bond. All right, so in compound B, we have a functional group, and that's the C double bond OOH. And then in compound C, we have a functional group, that's the OH functional group. So, okay, so for A, saturated hydrocarbon, only made of carbon and hydrogen, so it's like a hydrocarbon is in the true, truest sense of the word. So this is coming from the alkane series so that belongs to the alkanes compound b c o o h that is our carboxylic group so this is coming from the carboxylic acid group or the carboxylic you could just call the carboxylic acids or the alkanoic acids now they're saying compound c burns with a uh, blue flame in oxygen yes it does that's um ethanol and they want us to write a balanced equation for this reaction so then let's just get right ahead and do that so ethanol here c2h5oh that's a liquid that burns in oxygen whenever we write oxygen as an element like this we write it as o2 Anything that ends in gen or in is diatomic. So this will give us, just like when any other organic compound burns, this will give us carbon dioxide and water. Water here in the form of a vapor. Okay, so straight up, let's count. We have two carbons on the left. We have one on the right. So to fix that, and we're always balancing the order, Cho. So we go with the C's first. So we put a two there that fixes the two carbons for the right, two on the left. So that's good. We're going to look at the hydrogen, CHO. So H comes next. We have five here on the left plus one, that's six. Over that side and over the right side, we have two. So to make that equal to six, we would need to put a three right there, right in front of the water. And that makes three, two, six. So the carbons, the hydrogens are good. So it's now a matter of the oxygen. So this would be two, two, four from the carbon dioxide and then three from the water. That's seven, a little oddish. So we have one oxygen over here on the left from the ethanol. And we have two here. If we put a three here, that will give us three, two, six plus the one over here in the ethanol. That would make it seven. So this would be our balance equation. And then for part C, state which of the two compounds, A or C, is more soluble in water. Give a reason for your response. All right, A or C. Well, for one, straight up off the bat, we're going to go with compound C. Compound C is more soluble in water. For one, water is Water is polar and compound C, compound C. So water is polar and we know that like dissolves like. Now compound C has an OH group. So the presence of the OH group uh, means that this compound is polar. Unlike compound A, where we have just carbon and hydrogen. So this is um, a non-polar compound. So compound A is polar. So we just need to state, okay, compound C. As the OH group. So is polar. 
and, dis and dissolves in water, which is also polar. We could also state that, not to over answer, but we could state that compound A is nonpolar. And we know that like dissolves like. Okay, part D. State whether compound B or compound C would react more vigorously with sodium metal and give a reason for your choice. No, both of them would react with, um, with sodium here. Now, it comes down to a matter of which of them would let go of that hydrogen more readily. That hydrogen at the end, well, for one, compound B is a weak acid. Compound C, you know, it can behave as an acid, but it's even weaker than um, compound B. So the one that would be more reactive in this case, the one that would react more vigorously, would be compound B. And so we should give, we should give um, a reason for our answer. Now, the hydrogen in compound B is more readily lost or is more readily replaced by the metal than that hydrogen in compound C. So the hydrogen in compound B is more readily lost than the hydrogen in compound C. And, you know, this is due to the fact that the, we have a, the presence of a, a carbon carbon, sorry, not a carbon, carbon, carbon oxygen double bond, which adds to the polarity of the CO. Well, it adds to the polarity of the OH group in compound B. All right, but that would be, that's probably even over answering. So we're just going to state exactly why that the, we'll state that B is more polar with the C double bond O, so the H in the OH is more readily given up than the H in the OH. So the hydrogen in the OH of COOH in compound B is more readily lost than the hydrogen in the OH of compound C. And we'll just leave it right there. So, so far for this question, that's two, four, six, eight marks. So let's go for the other seven marks. Okay, in E, write a balanced equation for the reaction of compound C with sodium metal. Okay, so compound C is ethanol. So we're going to go again. That's C O H five O H, and this is a liquid which is going to react with sodium, which is a solid. In this case, that H at the end is going to be acting as a replaceable hydrogen with a very reactive uh, metal like sodium. So we'd end up with C2H5ONA. And this is actually, you can put ALC, this is in alcoholic, you call it alcoholic, um, alcoholic medium. It's not aqueous, no water is here. We're talking about liquid ethanol. And then this would liberate hydrogen, but we cannot write H by itself. It's diatomic, so it would have to be H2. Yes. And then, of course, if we're going to do that, we have to just finish off and ensure that we balance. So for us to have H2 there, we would need 2 right here. And then that would make everything here 2 on the left, the ethanol. So we just need to match that off with a 2. Let's ensure that this is visible. Two, and then the sodium would need to be two, and then that is it. Now, part F, describe one test that could be used to identify the gas that is produced in the reaction of compound C with sodium metal. Of course, we'll have to tell them what we expect, not just the test, but what we expect to observe. So 
we could with the solar lighted spleen at the mouth of the this tube and so all right so the gas present will put out the lighted splint with a pop it's hydrogen let's use the right terms so the pop that we hear is a mini explosion sometimes it's not really poppy it's squeaky sometimes and it just depends on the volume of the gas that is present. And that little pop or that squeak is just a mini explosion because hydrogen is explosive. Yes, that's right. Part G, compound B and compound C react together in the presence of a catalyst to form compound E. State the name of the catalyst. All right, just a reminder of what compound B is, compound E propanoic acid that's compound B and compound C we said earlier is ethanol so they're asking for the name of the catalyst the name of the catalyst well would we'll use um it sulfuric acid sulfuric acid is our catalyst and they want the fully displayed structure of compound D no, whenever compound D, this is propanoic acid, whenever we're drawing um, or we're showing the product, the ester formed when an organic acid reacts with an alcohol, we draw the acid part first. Okay, so probably what we should do, perhaps what we could do, we could, could redraw this in blue. So we're actually seeing where everything is coming from. Or track the red, track the blue. So we're going to pinch off. Let's use black to show our, or green to show what's happening. We're going to join these together. We're going to pinch off the OH from the acid and the H from the alcohol, which will give us water. We're not so concerned about the water. We want the fully displayed structure of compound D. All right, so we're going to go with red first. So we have a CH3. From the propanoic acid and we're just going to put on the H's as we go along um, then we have a CH2 then we have C with the double bond O and then from that now we're going to go on to the the blue compound so we're going to have now C we have the C double bond O from the red so we're going to have the blue then we're going to have a CH2 then we're going to have a CH3. They didn't ask us to name this. So this is our compound. And whenever I draw, whenever I draw an ester, it's just second nature for me to highlight the carb, highlight the, for me to highlight the ester linkage. So that is our compound. They did not ask us to name it. It's ethyl propanoid nonetheless. All right, and just like that, we've come to the end of the section. How many marks did you? Number four, sulfur and magnesium are two elements in the same period of the periodic table. The different properties of the oxides of these elements are presented in table two. All right, so we have the oxide of sulfur. It's a gas, that's the state. The melting point is negative 72 degrees Celsius. And for the oxide of the oxide of magnesium, it's a solid, and the melting point is two thousand eight hundred and fifty-two. Wow, that's a lot. That requires a lot of energy. Now, with reference to bonding, explain the difference in melting point between the oxides of sulfur and magnesium. So we're going to be talking about the bonding that's there. Don't want to get too much into the structure. It's hard to talk about the the bonding without talking about the structure, but we want to be very disciplined so we can get our full marks. So let's just go.
So for the oxides of sulfur, these are covalent compounds and they have covalent bonds. So you could say the intramolecular bond is covalent. Each molecule though is joined to another by weak intermolecular forces of attraction. As a result of this, because we have weak intermolecular forces of attraction, very little energy, very little energy is required to break these molecules from these forces of attraction, holding them together in the solid state. So they have very low melting point, low melting point of negative 72 degrees Celsius. Now, for the magnesium oxide, this is an ionic compound. They have ionic ones present, and these arise from very strong electrostatic forces of attraction between the cations and the anions. The forces require lots of energy to break, well, to break them apart, to break them apart when they're in the solid state. So, Magnesium has melting point of 2852, or you could say a high melting point. That should give us our six marks. Part two of 4A. Explain whether the oxides of sulfur and the magnesium will conduct electricity, and if so, under what conditions? All right, so let's just tell them. So the oxides of sulfur. So the oxides of sulfur will not conduct electricity under any condition. Now these are covalent compounds. So that's that straight up. No ions are present. No ions are present there. Nothing, nothing to carry a current if we were to apply a voltage. No magnesium, the oxide of magnesium. So MgO, MgO, All right, so we need to say here that for magnesium oxide, it will conduct electricity when molten, as at that time the ions are set free and can move and carry a current if a voltage is applied. Now, we need not say if it's molten because uh, magnesium oxide is not soluble in water. All right, and we need not to go into the details here. You probably need to look back over your solubility of um, your oxides. So magnesium oxide is insoluble in water. So we need not, to, need not talk about um, when it's dissolved in aqueous medium. This is enough right here for the four marks. Okay, so part B for the win. Figure four is a partial diagram of the apparatus. A group of students intend or, or propose to use to investigate whether ethanol, aqueous ammonia, and aqueous lead to nitrate would conduct electricity. So part one, complete the diagram in figure four in order to make it a circuit that is suitable for achieving the aim of this experiment. So we have the battery and they're showing us the positive terminal. They're showing us um, electrode A connected to the positive terminal, B connected to the negative terminal. So what we did know is a, uh, some sources will say it's a cell, or some will just say it's a container. So we just would need that to be present and we'd need to have our electrolyte. So our electrodes must be immersed into the electrolyte or not the electrolyte, whatever the liquid we're testing to see if it's an electrolyte. If it's an electrolyte, then it will conduct. So we would put our ethanol in the container then at another time, or aqueous ammonia, and at another time, or aqueous lead to nitrate. So we've done that. So part two now, that, that should give us the two marks. So we could state that we're putting the liquid here. Liquid to be tested. And what we would need as well, we would need since this is all we have, we could put in a, a lamp that would glow, of course, if we um, get if we get um, current passing 
that's if the liquid is if the liquid conducts electricity so they want us to know classify the three liquids given as conductors or non conductors no um our knowledge of you know we what you call it no weak acid weak bases should chip in but they said conductors are non conductors so even if it's a weak base or a weak acid we don't have any weak acid here once we'll get conduction occurring we'd have to classify the substance as a conductor we can't say weak conductor it's just a conductor or a non-conductor so we'll start with the most well obvious one conductors aqueous lead nitrate would be a conductor so we would put that here The other thing that will conduct, aqueous ammonia. And then our non-conductor would be ethanol. That would give us the other three marks to top it up to 15. How are you faring so far? Leave a comment. Did you get this right? What did you put for this? What do you have for your answer here? Okay. All right, so this is number five, part, well, 5A. Anaerobic fermentation occurs when yeast is used in the production of wine. Yeast, very important. All right, part one, define the term anaerobic fermentation. All right, so fermentation, we know once, um, once something ferments, it's forming an alcohol. And if they say anaerobic, we'll have to tell them what anaerobic means. Aerobic, air, and means without. So we're looking at the formation of alcohol in the absence of oxygen. So if we put that, we'll get our full marks. So we could say it's the conversion of glucose to alcohol in the absence of oxygen. All right, and they said here, that when yeast is used, so when they ask us now why high temperatures are not suitable for anaerobic fermentation in part two, we have to bear in mind that in yeast would have um, an enzyme and high temperatures would actually destroy the enzyme that is in yeast. That would actually cause them to become, you could say denatured. But if you say high temperatures will kill the enzymes um, in yeast, or will destroy the enzyme in yeast, then that will give you the marks. So the high temperatures will destroy the yeast, making the enzyme inactive. And they want us to write a balanced equation for the anaerobic fermentation of glucose. That's part three. So that's C6H12. O6, that's in aqueous medium. This, we're not using any air, it's anaerobic, so we need to just write this forming ethanol, C2H5. Perhaps ethanol is a theme for this paper because this is the third time we're encountering ethanol, or we have to do something with ethanol. So this will be ethanol here in aqueous medium. I guess we'd have to distill it would have to distill it to actually get the, the ethanol from the water. It's not like our equation earlier where we saw sodium, a very reactive metal, um, a very reactive metal reacting with um ethanol. So we'd get this, we'd get CO2. And to balance, we have six carbons on the left. We would need change of color here. We would need two here, and that would make four. And then, you know, you can look at it. We put two right here, that would fix it because we need six, 12 hydrogen, so two, five, 10, plus two times one there, two, so that would give us our 12. And then for the oxygen, we'd have two times this one here, which is two, and then two, two is four, so everything is checked. So that will give us our full mark. So there we go, we have five already.
Let's go for the other 10. Part B of 5. Soaps are formed from the alkaline hydrolysis or saponification of natural oils and fats, esters. Compound E, shown below, is an ester which is hydrolyzed by aqueous sodium hydroxide. Draw the fully displayed structures of the hydrolysis products. So um, what you could do if you're at this point, and I don't want to say clueless, I'm recommending that you check um, the link in the description below um, that outlines well, it that outlines reactions of esters. All right. So if you if you had covered that before the exam, then you should be you should be good. All right. So this is an ester. So whenever we're going to um hydrolyze, we're going to have hydrolysis of an ester. We always cut right here. All right. So cut right there. So we can draw our pair of scissors right there. That's where we cut. And when we cut there, we're putting, we're splitting water into OH and H, and we're putting the OH back onto the acid portion, which is the part normally drawn first. That's the part with the C double bond O. And then we're putting the H back onto our alcohol. So in this case, we're going to get the salt of the acid here. Okay, so if we're putting on the putting on the OH. The OH would have to now react with the sodium hydroxide, even though I'm getting too much into the mechanism. And that would give us the salt of the acid. So we would have CH3, then there's a C double bond O, and then we would have ONA. Because even if the, the OH goes back on, it will not have to react with the sodium hydroxide to give us the salt. And we would end up with the corresponding alcohol. And the alcohol here would have the OH group. Again, it's ethanol. So it's the fourth time we are seeing ethanol on this on this paper overall. All right, so that is that. That should give us four marks. So let's keep racking them up. Okay, part one of C, name the byproduct of the saponification of fats and oils. Now, earlier they told us that the saponification of fats and oils give us a soap. So we cannot say back soap here. We'd have to give them the other thing that we'd get. All right. So we'd actually get um would actually get a special alcohol, which is called glycerol. And as I said before, you be sure to check out the link in the description below for the video that actually breaks down reactions of esters. And now they're asking us so. I guess since we're talking about soap, they're looking at applications of soap and soapless detergents. All right, state one difference, part two. One difference between the effect of using soaps and soapless detergents on hard water. Okay, and it's just one mark, so we're just going to hit it right on the head. So, so when we use soaps in um, hard water, soaps do not lather well. In hard water, we get the formation of a scum. Let's say they form scum. All right, and then soapless detergents, on the other hand, so we would not get any scum with with or soapless detergents. Part D. Figure 5 shows the structures of an amino acid and propene. Right? Amino. Amino, we have the NH2 group there. And then acid portion, we have the COOH. And you can check out another link in the description below that will look at amino acids and how they're join to actually give us um, polyamides. You can look at that addition versus condensation. Perhaps this question is leading us there, but you can check out that video for more details on how the processes um, work. State the type of polymerization that amino acid in figure, the amino acid in figure five would undergo. All right, so amino acids would undergo 
condensation, polymerization. State the general name for the type of polymer formed from the amino acid in figure five. So it would be a polyamide. All right, be sure to check out that link to be on the safe side. For the last two marks, state two chemical tests that can be used to distinguish between propene and its polymer. All right, two marks. So the polymer of propene would be polypropene. So test one, test both with acidified KMNO4. Propene decolorizes it, changes it from purple to colorless. All right, polymer does not. All right, the next test we could use, we could test both with, both of them with Br2 liquid in CCL4. So bromine liquid in tetrachloromethane. Again, propene would decolorize um, this um, solution. Propene would change. Propene changes this solution from reddish brown, or you could say brown, to colorless. And we could have used aqueous bromine, that's Br2 aqueous bromine in aqueous medium, that would be yellow. And then the propene would, would decolorize that as well. And the polymer would have no change on it. So of the three tests, um, the propene would decolorize all of the substances and then the, 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 the polymer would have no effect on the testing reagents. All right, and that would give us our full marks. So we're at number six, part A. Farmer Brown reaped a crop of vegetables and reported that the yield was far below what was expected. An analysis of the soil revealed that there was a deficiency of magnesium. Oh no. Outline the importance of magnesium on plant health. Now we have to read our question carefully. No, plant health in general. Why is magnesium important? Or importance of magnesium on plant health. So we'd say, all right, so magnesium forms part of chlorophyll, and chlorophyll is needed to make is needed to make um, food. So that's very important for the plant. And then the magnesium, it aids in protein formation. All right, and that's, that's two, there are more like it. It's used in energy transfer to get a little more technical, but those will give us the marks. In part two now, we're supposed to explain how a magnesium, how, ma how a magnesium deficiency can result in the low yield of vegetables. All right. So we said earlier that magnesium forms a part of chlorophyll. Let's make the link now. If, if there's a deficiency in magnesium, then there will be a low amount of chlorophyll. If there is a small amount of chlorophyll, then there's going to be a reduced ability, you know, in the plant making food. And then if there's little food being manufactured, then there just won't be much to store. And so there will be low yield. All right, let's put that in words. Right. So if a lot of food is manufactured, then there will be a lot of food to, to, store, to be stored. The yield will be high. So magnesium forms a part of chlorophyll. Plants use chlorophyll to trap sunlight and make food. 
if there's a deficiency in magnesium, then it means that we'll have very little chlorophyll. If there's little chlorophyll, then we'll have little food being manufactured. If little food is um, being manufactured, then there would be little food available to be stored. And so we'll have a low yield. That should give us our marks. Part three of A, of 6A, state two other metal ions which are important to plant growth and the result of each deficiency. So straight up, just like in us, I guess we're similar to plants, calcium ions, the deficiency, stunted growth. And then we could give potassium ion. And then if we have a deficiency, we'll end up with weak spindly leaves. Or spindly leaves. Also, we can get undersized seeds. Poorly developed seeds. All right, so that's um, that's two. I think um, we could have put iron. This would give us many yellow yellow leaves, but we just want um, we just want two, so we'll work with those two, and that would give us four marks. Okay, um, part B. Um, this one speaks about um, the pollution, plastic pollution, and its effect on the environment. Um, be sure to check out um, a video that I did on this in celebration of World Ocean Day, June 8th. Please check the link in the description for that one. We're just going to get straight to the point here. But if you're really interested in looking after the environment, just having an idea having, you know, more insight into how pervasive this um, problem of plastic pollution of the marine waters or of our oceans is, then you can just check that out. Let's just get straight to the point. The Caribbean Sea and many oceans around the world have been found to be polluted by solid waste, mainly in the form of plastics. Part one state two examples of plastic waste that are commonly found in the sea and the oceans. So we could plastic bags, plastic bottles. All right, that will do it. We could do fishing gears. Probably not as common, but common still. Discuss two harmful effects of plastics on marine life and the possibilities here the possibilities are endless we're just going to give um two so all right so harmful effects um harmful is you know it doesn't have to necessarily mean death but it actually happens that that can be a, um, one of the effects so sometimes these animals they can become trapped or become entangled you know in these um plastic materials that are left and um, they, they can actually be cut. They can get, you know, bad wounds, lacerations. So they can cause deep lacerations. So you can end up with some organisms um, being wounded. We're going to just give like two, two examples. You can get wounding of the whales and turtles. Not, not only those, but um, entanglement can cause deep lacerations. And then sometimes, when these animals um, eat the plastic, for example, or turtles, they will mistake a plastic bag for a jellyfish and they'll eat that. And then their guts become filled with plastic. It gives them the sense of them being full. And so they end up dying of hunger later on. And I mean, some of them know when they become trapped, they, it reduces their ability 
to actually swim. And so they now become, you know, easy pickings for predators. They can't escape danger or they can't swim and find food and eventually they die. So we'll just leave it there. Remember to check out the link in the description below or you can check out the card um, above just to actually look at that presentation in honor or in celebration of World Ocean Day. Remember, use what's in your hand, take that bottle, recycle it. Reduce, reuse, recycle. And just like that, we've come to the end of this session. I hope this was informative. I hope you actually were able to work the questions with me and you actually masked up the marks just like um, I did here. I hope you actually did very well, right? Remember to like share and consider subscribing if you find value in what i do here on couple later